interrupting the current Corona cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed. This is cricket tube busting episode BTWRLM 368. Yes, Moose Girl, I heard it. I heard what they did in Michigan. But we got a little bit more to do, but I'm going to point out how this all works now this week. How we're not quite stepping up right where we need to be. And you saw, yes, you walk into the, instead of standing at the steps, you walk in and you can start to have an effect. But that wasn't enough. You hand it to the legislators and they'll take control of it. And then you'll see that evidence this week. Before I get all of that and move you into how, even if you don't want to challenge that there is no test, folks. There is nothing, no demonstrable exit. There's no demonstrable thing to invoke police power. If you don't even want to go there, I'll show you how you can not even challenge that and show how the orders that have been coming out of the governors are likely unlawful. And all you had to do, and I'll show you today how to do this pretty quickly, all you had to do is go to the statutes or the Constitution. And what you see there shall, we remind you, bring you back to what I told you, the Virginia condition, so-called sanctuary uh, city, uh, counties, what I told you had to be done actually in producing the maladministration, use the Constitution again to produce the maladministration, remove their immunity, because the Constitution also says they have none, and bring that out, as I give you an anticipation, was what also needs to happen in Michigan. Well, they had a bunch of people causing change inside the legislators' house of horror. You can't hand it to them just on the complaint, you, uh, as far as you're standing there and screaming and yelling. You've got to start laying the foundation and record. And you base it on not your opinions and not what you think is going on and all the stuff that you feel is going on but you can't quite prove. You just lay it out, right, with the black and white that already exists. And those of you that have done this stuff before where you've written documents, did notices, wrote league lawsuit complaints, you really should be kind of stepping back in into this. Uh, as I've been suggesting that you can do this without jeopardy, without the question, and just strictly showing people how to pull this together. It's, it's not that hard. And I've been holding off on this thing I'm going to get to, on this timing thing, wait, kind of waiting to see if anybody else would come up with it. When no one's working, you know, we just kind of do what we do during the week. This is what I've been helping on in the last few weeks relative to what I told you the county power is and where you get, you can actually, when you don't have a, but a few people, you go to your local county because that is the governmental institution that does have a lot of power. And it's not, um, you know, a free ticket. There's lots of ignorance. Uh, as I was telling Sibel Edmonds on the, on the Twitter, it's a mass ignorance. And I don't say that as an excuse and to excuse. That's a real problem. But the, the reality is, as a society, as a people, we are massively ignorant. And I told you we're at least two or three steps back. Maybe four. I mean, there's just a whole, I don't even know where to, where to really drop off anymore. Watching Michigan people walk into the, the, the state house, Michigan, that was encouraging. But again, they stopped at the door there. They stopped at the sergeant of arms. They stopped with the state police stopping them. And I'm not saying that you run them down. What I'm saying is that they're the ones you then serve the first notices of the maladministration and demand under their inherent power to check the admi the maladministration of another of another branch. That's when you drop that on them. And there's repercussions when you do a little bit more research. As I've been, I've told you all of this and all where to look if you just keep in track of what I'm doing to show you the pathway of how this thing works. You get into federal law, and that becomes that. Title 18, excuse me, ti yeah, Title 18, Section 3 and 4, right up front in the beginning of that chapter, where you have uh, the felonies of telling an official that they were, had a job to do because there was a, a breach of the law, and they don't. They become, they fall into uh, liability, and then if you, if they don't, then they, you also have a misprison of that felony or the treason uh, also for those that don't act. So that is what you start to bear on. And it's really just a simple statement. You don't have to go like we used to maybe on and on about all the stuff and all the rights we thought we had. In fact, I'll tell you, I'll show you how somebody has gone down to what I suggested to you on the time. We've got someone that actually did. And the court came right back and said, yeah, you're right. 
Obviously, the governors don't like it. But as I was telling you, there's these simple remedies out there that I'll now I'll now I have evidence. If again, I've been telling you all this before. It doesn't seem that people understand or believe or whatever it is about me, about what I've offered. But now we got the evidence, and it's called coming in time. And uh, this is in this is in a time which got my caught my attention. I'll get now into my tabs. In, in Freaker's Ball, there Grimner was reporting on a, a story written by Jeffrey Tucker, and you need to read this story when you get it. I think Jeffrey Tucker, which who I don't know, I think he does a good uh, job of going through uh, this this condition. But the title of this was Woodstock occurred in the middle of a pandemic. And what I found, what struck me, and what has been striking me is that that's when you kind of hear that and you kind of see the pictures of Woodstock. Boy, there was, social distancing wasn't even a, a consideration, was it? And so we look at that. That that title just kind of set me into a different mode because I've been wondering why you all don't, those of you that are of the baby boomer generation, why you haven't been acting even to protect yourself. You know, you have all the pensions that are going down the tubes right now based on a nothing, based on something that there is no test, based on the co uh, conflation of a common cold that has flu symptoms. All provably uh, wrong, uh, fraud, and I'm not saying my opinion or our, our opinion. The CDC, as I pointed out, put the links in the broadcaster for weeks and weeks now, proved to you from the government's own statements the admission and confession of the fraud against you. So today, Woodstock occurred in the middle of the pandemic. I just started to think about that. I wonder if that's kind of why nobody actually moves to protect themselves. They, you were, you were trained to come together in Woodstock, whether or not this was planned or not, it happened. Uh, to be together, realize it's not a problem, and so you don't think it's a problem. Uh, you're not paying much attention. We got through the last one. We'll get through this one. What you don't understand is they attach the theft of your of your whole savings, your pensions, your way of life, your future, and the future of all the all the kids you've had, attached to this pan, so-called pandemic. Remember, it's as pandemic. It's characterized as one. It isn't one. And I've gone through all of that before as well. So Woodstock, interesting. I was just wondering, is that why we're not seeing a, a bunch of actual, actual a remedy happening? We, we all got together. Not we. I didn't, wasn't there. But people that got together at Woodstock were, were involved in a pandemic. There's critical observation here for Jeffrey to, to make for us. Again, reaching back and seeing. We've already been through this once, but now they're using it to advance uh, serious crimes against you. And I'm still astonished. I don't even know what the I keep. I don't know the adjectives to use anymore. That no one really responds, and we do a little bit, and yet it's. I look. I can tell you. You can. The black and white tells us we're not doing enough. And so here, let's move on to what this is going on. What this so-called pandemic that we lived through in the in Woodstock time of Woodstock, and the, the densities of people that happened. And you'll see Jeffrey's story tells you that nothing. It was simply. The, what the government does, and when you read the black and white, you'll see this is all the government has the power to do, is watch and monitor and do what it can to help mitigate, ultimately. If it can't jump in and contain, like you might see a fire, forest fire, then it sits back to mitigate. And I found proof of all this here this weekend as I kept the thing that's been niggling at my mind was where was the, for the American standard of police power, where was that declared? And I've been telling you I can't find it. I've been uh, pointing out to you that COVID-19 as a title is just merely symptoms. That's the CDC says that. There is no test. The CDC says that, and the FDA agrees by their uh, diagnostic panel. Where was it that, that we have an actual exigent declaration, a declaration of an exigence that was actually police power? And I'm going to touch all this as we keep moving. i got quite a bit to do here again. Uh, that uh, I wanted to remind you of something here. Uh, the where part of this thing came from the UN. Part of it came from the. And I'll suggest to you there's another article that proves the uh, suggestions of the WHO, not the Rock Group or not the Owl, but the World Health Organization. The authority, so-called, they have is really on merely suggestion. I found an article that talks about that. But let me explain now hear what someone in the WHO came out to say, or excuse me, a UN chief comes out to say, as I look at the title, about that they are going to not let this crisis go to waste. Uh, and we want to hear that again uh, because 
I have told you back in 2015, all those modernization acts were everything that was coming in the future that was going to be controlled. This is through the United States government. Remember the modernization for food security? Yeah, and all of a sudden I told you when they put that in, your food's going to be less secure, and they're eventually going to d turn it down. And now we're actually seeing that the label, out-of-country label law has now been defeated, so now they can bring any meat, and they are now, while they tell our ranchers out in the West to destroy cattle, or at least we're told letters are being issued to get ready to do that. And I've uh, some people are telling me the meat, uh, meat aisles are now ha seeing the effects. Some stores are hit, some stores aren't. And so they're after your food system. They have been. You know that when they made the Modernization Acts. Modernization is tied to international. And again, I say this stuff and just hope you all have read enough to know that. And don't argue with me on that. Uh, and if you don't know, go research that you'll find this out to be the fact. Because we have things to do today. All that becomes just the foundation for why uh, to expose that we have an invader. And we've had had an invader. But UN chief says pandemic must be used to deindustrialize the West transition to green energy and i can go through again uh, these articles if you go through and look at this article and look at the statements they want to use the pandemic recovery to roll out the global climate change agenda uh, including allowing fossil fuel companies to collapse and using taxpayer stimulus money to fund green jobs we have heard this before the it's written they actually i've told you this this thing that they what greta didn't get in uh, this coronavirus, the foe, foe, has done in spades, and they were to do and meet their goal of 2030. That is mentioned in this article today uh, that I'm referring to. And they say the, uh, the Germany uh, that regarding the global warming conference in Germany, in Berlin, Germany, that the economic turmoil caused by the coronavirus pandemic presents a, quote, rare and short window of opportunity to accelerate their globalist 2030 agenda. I also must say, I found this, and uh, I'm, I want to stick to the quotes that I'm talking here from the people, because I got this from a website that I'm not, again, so sure on the people that do this, even though they have a lot of following. I'm not necessarily wholeheartedly uh, embracing the totality of the presentation, but for the quotes that are coming out, it, it fits completely with the what I told you before, uh, relative to the documentation that's available to us, that everyone now starts to see, like lockstep was written and now it's in effect. It was one of four scenario narratives and what it's being executed almost to a T. And so these things are out there and they're not a surprise, but, but we should have been able to anticipate it. I want to remind you that this is what they are working at, at the UN, which is the WHO, the organizational structure. They're coming after these things. They're going to take an opportunity to destroy you all, and I say it that way because when you go look at Agenda 2030, that says you will live in economic servitude. It's sustainable debt. Ultimately, you'll read, as I'd read on the broadcast years ago, read through it to show you that this is the, the highlighted points relative to what you'll be seeing coming in. And again, they're doing it with this, and we're letting them is the big problem I want to talk about here. We continue to let them do this, and we have it in our power to stop if we would just get together understand how simple it is to discuss that. And but then I ran across this. I think I also heard on the Freakers Ball, uh, it was an interesting little study. I want to remind you that the UN promotes uh, veg uh, vegetarianism. And I have talked with some people that are of that idea, uh, that sphere of understanding and belief, that relig green religion. And they're, I think, to a large extent, mostly all vegetarians, if not vegan. Yeah, interestingly, we now find more of a connection if we keep watching. If we needed to have a better idea of what the insanity might come from that we're having to deal with here, and we're letting it, and this is how I'm telling you, it's just so easy. If we would just stop making excuses, we can shut this thing all down. Uh, the baffling connection between veganism and depression. There's a report that came out that I think I heard it on Brigger's Ball. An astonishing uh, revelation, if that's what you thought it was. But remember, the UN follows this. I suppose they practice what they preach. Remember, all this stuff that comes from those people is is actions, is responses, is, re is policy that's created by people that we now have a study that says they are mentally deficient because they don't eat meat. Now, that may twist a lot of you that are that are vegans or vegetarians, and you may think that you're high capacity, whatever the heck they want to talk there. I'm not really talking against you. I'm saying 
this shows, if we're going to take any reports and we're going to look at them, uh, that we have to question those that go down that lifestyle relative to how we are. It's no different than I would say, let's test everything. When we see insanity rising to such a level, we have to ask, why did it go here? And so this, uh, without again, I feel partly I don't really want to talk much about it because people will get offended by it. But if this, given that this has been found out, there's actually quite a few people talking about it. The study claims eating meat can help improve mental health is a serious allegation, if just an allegation. And if this test would hold out, and if you go through, so I don't want to say much about whether or not you will agree with these. You need to look at this. I say you need to look at it because I'm seeing insanity and I have no other explanation for it. And so maybe this would give us the point. I want to remind you, you got to put this as a possibility category, possibility and possibility, probability, when you are dealing with things that you look out in the world and you see, this is insane. Maybe it is, folks. And I've told you before, if that comes to rule you, you have to throw it down. Otherwise, it rules you to your destruction. And so it's, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you're insane, but we might have an underlying cause I wanted to point this out. This is pretty, in a way, pretty astonishing. It, it kind of answers to why we're dealing with these insanities and uh, loony people that come up with these ideas that you can't really talk to. You can't really, they'll call you names, but they'll deny that you can, you can kind of identify facts and, and evidence. They'll rely on science that lies and fraud. Best science, they call it names, best science, so they get you, it's actually an intentional insanity to try and impose upon you that what they believe is the best, but it's not. It's a false advertisement, it's a propaganda, it's a PR, uh, getting you to buy, oh, I can't believe it's not butter. And you say, well, okay, yeah. And in fact, that's not the way to grow. You're, you're dealing with a nutcase. Well, there might be a reason. You're not, you're not getting the actual proper diet that you need. Now, whether or not you can do that in veganism, I don't know. I've heard there's lots of problems. I tried to do it about kill me. You know, I did it for over a year, and I just had to go back. There's a balance, folks, and I found out that to be the case. And so, interesting, uh, again, I, I look at this stuff, do I read it or not? But here it is. These people uh, that wants to use this climate change, it's insanity. Well, where did it come from? Well, maybe from people that are vegans and vegetarians as well. Maybe their influence is now having an effect on your life to come up and say, well, there's a coronavirus bogus that's going to kill you, or you're going to kill someone else with something you don't have symptoms over, so we get to control you. It's an insanity, besides other, other adjectives, psychopathy, soci sociopathy, and all this other stuff. So, whether or not you agree with that, I'm saying we see an insanity in the world. I'm going to pull this over to my probabilities and possibilities while I try to figure out what the heck are these people really, what's the source of their of their energy to talk in such insane ways? And I'd say you don't argue with them. You just understand what you're dealing with. And I said, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with any invader? Well, if you don't have the numbers, you, you have to deal with an objective basis and try to find people that reason the same way in an objective basis and act through it. And so for what I've been doing for over a decade, we don't find that many people that actually reason through facts and have a black and white objective basis. And so the going is very slow. I suppose if I think about it, I don't know of anybody that's just a vegan or a vegetarian, either the people that I work with. And so I don't, I don't know if that's a proof or not. But anyway, I guess I can go on. There's lots to read in this stuff. It's actually astonishing to hear the connections. I have two links for you uh, in the blogcaster that will come from two different angles. One is from a real, doc, an actual so-called doctor, a real doctor, a licensee doctor, and another one is someone looking into the problem and really can't understand, well, can't, asking questions. Can it improve our mental health? Can meat help improve our mental health? Study says so. That's a, that's just a shocking reality to see in, in our society, as, as insane as it's looking, that that's contributing to the problem. And I don't mean just people generally. The people that are motive in the in the world against you are the ones that are that way. Or they're lying to you about that. And that's still a problem, isn't it? So just wanted to say the UN and the WHO, they all tell you you're going to go to veganism. They're going to tell you that their policies are that the meat is bad. You watch your meat manufacturing go down the tubes right now for no good darn reason. 
well, well, Trump says it's okay. We got storage. Well, then why are why are they importing foreign meat well, that's not labeled as such? Then why are they telling our ranchers, as far as I can see, to destroy food? Destroy, get ready to destroy your cattle. Why don't they just make let them go out and eat the grass this spring and since just wait some time out? Why don't we look at it that way? Why are we doing such a, an insane response? Now, I, I have a feeling that the people making these decisions aren't necessarily vegan or vegetarian. I think they're just psychopaths because they're lying to you. Nobody in their right mind would do any of this. And there's going to be a reason, whether it's veganism or, or not, or vegetarianism, the point is, is you have to identify something that's insane that's going to come to harm you, and you have definitely have to stop that. If you don't, it definitely will affect you. Whether you realize it or not, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect your future, your future's future, and the future we want is not yours. Uh, moving into something else, what I found interesting is a link I found. It's getting, uh, I called it on the Twitter, I called it the, uh, it's getting the whack-a-mole treatment on cens- by censorship. And I, don't, I can't speak German, uh, but there's a German title to this. And uh, it's about a what appears to be a Russian office, military officer, uh, discussing what Russia, uh, and he's retired, I'm sure, discussing what Russia is looking at through at the pandemic, so-called. And they call out about everything I've told you here is the way they look at it. Well, what I found intriguing about it, why I'm bringing it to your attention, remember last week I exposed to you the military false front that uh, the military created false front that sits there to control the place and that got me on to show i found run across some more things to show you this week about the who gets the information but this video that i'll give to you to watch you, you can listen it's all you got to read it in uh, uh, closed captioned language english language because they're speaking two different they're speaking russian it sounds like and german on the voiceovers and they've got two voiceovers it's a little bit I had to just watch and read. But there, he's explaining pretty much what I explained here. That even if this guy is true, if this is what he's saying, they're explaining that they're looking at it as a military maneuver operation here. They don't believe in this coronavirus at all. My question would be, why is Putin doing what he's done? There is a political reason why he would come up with the same answer as the West, to squelch the fear that, the fire of fear that's been created in the West that the Russian propaganda machine cannot overcome. And so there might be a pragmatism in Putin to go ahead and do something that wasn't done here in the United States, keep his people calm, get let them go ahead and buy into the fraud, but their military is not buying into it. And I wanted you to see the statements because I think there's very little that I've left uncovered over since the beginning of the year about this condition relative to the UN, relative to the geopolitical maneuvering that's going on, relative to now bringing up the idea that the U.S. done this thing. Again, I told you, hold that as a possibility and probability. I'm not willing to go ahead and try and do all the research to study it. I, I figure I can only deal with locally how to stop it, the uh, insanity locally. And I've told you, you got to step back. you got to look at the thing. And the only way you're going to ad- address insanity or a foreign imposition is to rely on the black and white, the codes, even the codes and the statutes and your constitutions in order to find the protection that sits in there, that I've found sits in there, in order to be able to counter all this. And I've told you how over years how we we do this. But uh, Russia is not looking at this as some, even a, just a merely political action. They're actually looking at this as the military. And I think they had any nation has to, a military maneuvering in the world. And so that brought up my, my discussion with you last year. And then I heard this uh, story, um, and it sounds, well, you can, we can focus in on the origins of it, and it ties us back into the potential and the possibility that the United States causes, remember, going through Harvard, going through its connection to Five Eyes, going through its connection to biowarfare labs, going through the fact that the Chinese in Canada were in Canada, the Chinese soldiers were in Canada. We have a lineage of handoff, and we also have the other story where the U.S. military was there at the same time that China then come up and said that we it looks like we may have been set up. This may be an attack. So everyone's going to military mode. And I think you almost necessarily have to, whether or not you respond and uh, realize that although so-called coronavirus, even if it's true what's out there, the common cold or the influenza is out there, and it's a bad flu year, 
that it was imposed upon them, they go to military com- military protection, is almost natural for any nation to do. But it's also a tactic as well. So, again, I'm back to, I don't know really what all that is, but I do know that there's somebody's taking great strides to kill a nation. And I'm only interested in the one I can live in, and even local to me, kill a state relative to these this insanity. And it does look like attack, but it's not one that's obviously military. As I've told you to look back the carnival mirror of, of the Middle East, that we see there is happening to you in the United States. All this seems to be that kind of a reflection. The U.S. germ warfare research leads to new early COVID tests. I think I heard this on Freaker's Ball, too. And as I say that, they're taking all my news. So anyway, thanks, Grimner, for bringing this out to people. Anyway, I wanted to focus beyond different than what Grimner read. He read through this. He highlighted that the U.S. germ warfare research is already on this. I've told you the military's all been in on this. For the uh, uh, We live under a military consequence, whether you recognize it or not. And so that part wasn't surprising. What I wanted to know is where's the test? If they're already on it and they're getting a test, what test have they developed? Because the CDC, who is connected with that, remember you have the Surgeon General is a military officer. Where is the test? And they talk about a blood test right up, made by the germ war research. Well, okay, that's pretty ominous sounding. But what's the test? If they're advanced, what's the test? They're coming to make their mark and silently tell you, stamp their approval on something in order to tell you who's actually in control. What's the test? Well, you read through down far enough, and you're going to find out, folks. It's that lateral flow test that means nothing more than the PCR test, which means nothing more than your immune system is working. And that's why the CDC still says there's no actual test for the actual virus. There's a test responding to you have symptoms for COVID-19. And so, again, you've got to replace these terms. Every time you see COVID-19, remember, you have to say flu-like symptoms. When you see pandemic, you have to say suggested as a pandemic, characterized as a pandemic, because it's not. WHO did not change their assessment. Now, this is all starting to come out now. I told you this happened at the week it happened. I could get to the broadcast to tell you that was happening. So this is all just water in the bridge for under the bridge for me. So germ warfare research is all over this thing to come and tell you and champion they have a test. But it's the same. It's the pregnancy test, ultimately, what they have, folks. And so this was kind of indicative to me that maybe there's not, again, there's nothing going on in this. Even the military doesn't have anything advanced. And so, thank you for uh, Grimner for pulling this out. For me, I'm looking for I'm looking for the proof. I'm looking for what's justifying the police power that has you all locked down and you taking it. Nah, some of you aren't. Yeah, I see the Huntington Beach, great stuff, but that's not still what you're supposed to do. As I commented last week, because you have to out the infrastructure and the people working through that infrastructure that allowed this to get to the point that you were locked down. As I told a colleague, and now we're getting into some research that's been done that I then added my view, observations of it to, to reapply. There is nothing here that any government actually has to make these orders valid. And so today what I'm going to show you is even if you don't want to pull the links together to prove that part, I can go to the next step of, of a, it's not a, I'll say a tactic, but it's, it's just another option. Not to challenge the executive orders at all. And yet within the black and white constitutional constraints or statutory constraints, and I said last week, you have to go to the statutory because an occupying force runs through those statutories and codes. That's how you know you're underneath a dif- distinctly different a de facto organization than de jour. And that's why there's savings clauses for those because those are the reminders under international law the occupier has to remember things it can't change. It, there's, it can change anything it can change, but it can't change anything it cannot change. And if you see the so references to that, I've talked to you and explained, that would be similar to the Mexican land grants for the United States taking over the south, so the southwest of west of the United States of America, and they have to, they honor those land grants from Mexico. That's the kind of things an occupying force, whether by conquest or purchase, has to continue. And so that's, you start to see these, these, bright lines of delineation for power and uh, trust obligations involved, which I identified early, early on, decades ago, which has been the guiding lights for me to come to tell you the way I do, 
how I can, how I, why I move into some area and I look at where I look at and why I come up with the information that I do and why I focus on what I do and how that keeps, keeps the narrow path, keeps me on the narrow path and essentially keeps all the highway robbers off. But you have to have this awareness of what's there. Where you get that, even within the code, even within the statute of the occupiers, you find that there's limitations. The Republican form government, representative government in the United States of America was a limited form. I've said go look for those limits because that's where you'll see every time you'll see the savings clauses removed or ignored. And everything that we do that's successful and qu pretty quickly successful is to expose that in every context because let's go back just to the UN thing. Step back from the military for a moment. The UN thing, that's how they do it. Remember, alternative dispute resolution has nothing to do with your law. It has to do with the suggestion that you step away from your law and entertain the alternative. And the alternative is these steps and plans and all this other thing, and no one's understood that. And so since the 80s, I could, actually before, in the mid-70s, the beginnings of the infrastructure for taking on down your property rights and your system and everything else, on top of the bar system's occupation back in the 50s, you can see within the statutory framework, the policy framework, how they've dismantled your nation. Since about the 70s, I can tell, in property law, which is more directly connected to us, so we, it's more tangible. That's the only reason why we can go there easier, and why I, I kind of stay on that. But here we come into, what is this authority that's come down? How did they come about it? Where is the, we got U.S. germ warfare research in on it now, and all they come up with is just a, a, a pregnancy P test, essentially, that lateral flow test that I talked about. I found that in the study, remember? we talked. I just refer, referenced all this stuff. And so there's no test there. It says you have an immune system. And essentially, I forgot to mention it like it's a big deal. The baby in a pregnant mother is really a foreign body, and that's the body. The mother's responding to it is what you're seeing. It's that test. Your body's immune system is responding to something. If they did that now and didn't know, didn't identify, didn't look at you when you took that test, they'd think you had COVID. And you're, it's actually a pregnancy. That's how stupid this whole whole thing actually is, and we're seeing the cooking the books. Remember, cooking the books is part of the part of the plan. I find it amazing how people regurgitate this stuff through all the social media over and over and over, and it's really, it's really not a thing. It's you almost should expect it. As soon as you see it, you should be focusing in on how to how to stop it. That's that's the criminal right there. And they just cooked it like what? The, the hockey stick is the same thing. It took a few years to find it, but there we go. We found it. And so now you still have the insane ones that refuse to eat meat. They want to get a better mental health, apparently, in the latest study for that, who want to resist you. And they're mental defective at this point. I've told you the, a lot of these people I've said are abused. And there we may have the, have actually a, systemic problem right there in proof. But getting over to here, remember I've been, okay, we, U.S. Jewish warfare, military, they step up, try to do their thing, and all they have is the pregnancy test. Okay, that's it. That's how fast and quick is what it is. Go read down far enough in that story, and you'll see that. That's the only thing I was really interested in when I heard the story. Yeah, it's pretty cool that germ warfare is involved. Maybe they, you know, maybe they got something involved, but what the answer was, another, it was just another pregnancy test. Isn't that amazing? There is no big time problem here is there and so let's go back look at i wanted to continue a little bit on this military uh, that it's if you know where to read and you know how to read in the code and statute they'll tell you the military consequence we've lived under in this united states of america as i say from the civil war and I, anybody who doesn't agree with it please present to me the either either the treaty of peace ending it between the states and the district the united states district or the proclamation ending the civil war that we, when we read that, the proclamation that's promoted as such actually didn't. And I've read that on the Behind the Woodshed to show you that there's this military consequence and everything will eventually, on a need-to-know basis, anything that's an emergency will go to the military. And so it just so happens I uh, was dealing, or not dealing, I was got, offered some research, uh, some search that was done on some work that's going, that a colleague is doing, and focus me in on the emergencies for uh, the Oregon state and the declaration of a uh, state of emergency there. And uh, 
just looking. I was glancing really quickly through. Sometimes I just kind of I look for the stuff. I'm looking for certain things. I'm not until I see something that interests the problem to solve the problem or is the problem. I don't stop much. I wasn't even looking at this for this point that I'm going to read to you. It was aside from what I was actually after, but happened to come under my glance as I'm looking, scrolling through this law. And you have, I've given you links eventually in the broadcaster over at Sound Minds over there at YouTube uh, that may pull up, uh, that I've given you a couple of things you can look at. I'm just interested in a couple of things here for the idea to show you. There's a military structure that gets notice of everything that's important to it to make sure that things are under control. And we found it right here in the Declaration of State, a State of Emergency, uh, where it says, uh, and this will be referred to a little bit later in the broadcast when I touch this, Oregon's governors has now brought this this section to bear, uh, that the, or- the governor may declare, uh, well, she brought this to bear again, and then I'll show you how that's in violation as well, and simply stated and clearly found. But the governor here, uh, at uh, or, uh, ORS 401-165, the governor may declare a state of emergency by proclamation at the request of a county governing body or after determining that an emergency has occurred or is imminent. A very serious point here. You see the county requests that. Now, you go to the definitions in this. You look around for enough. You find the definitions that the, your county is determined to be a, an author. It's a, a health authority. And this becomes critical as we move through how you go local to solve the problem. Remember, these governors have declared the expanse of the emergency statewide. And yet you'll also see in these statutes that they can should only li- they can only li- they can only declare an emergency for a as limited a territory as possible. So when the health authority called the county comes forward and says, "We don't have this emergency," and we're ready and able to handle anyone that might come. You've now punched a hole in the governor's ter- statewide territorial declaration and proclamation. Getting back, so it's a, okay, so getting back to this one, you see a dynamic here. It's explained what can happen. There's a limited thing that goes on, on here. Now the governor can declare an emergency, uh, determining that an emergency has occurred or is imminent. Now hold that out in your mind because remember now we, we go back to they have to declare the emergency. Today, I'm not going to challenge that. But remember, there has to be a lawful emergency when they say that emergency has to be a lawful cause. And so number two was what trip caught my eyes. As soon as I actually, I should say, is what caught my eyes was number three. And so let me jump down there. And then when I saw three, I had to jump back up because what I saw didn't catch my eyes because when they name agencies, you don't know what they're connected to. Number three says this, underneath this authority, that if in the judgment of the adjutant general, the governor cannot be reachable for available communication facilities in time to respond appropriately to an emergency, the adjutant general shall notify the secretary of state, or if the secretary of state is not available, the the state treasurer uh, with uh, that, the governor is not available. Right there, do you hear the extension to power through the Constitution? That is what's going on there. But who is, who has the judgment power? The first sentence, uh, the first section says the governor determines. This one says an adjutant general has judgment. And that stopped my eyes right there. I don't know if any of you already know what an adjutant general is. Well, let me jump back up, because that's what God said. Wait a minute. Now, there's what I was talking about last week, right in the code. The thing that's invisible, the thing that operates automatically within the system, if no one reads it, that they don't even know there's an interposition of an authority that, that sits there to be advised all the time. And this one tells you it makes judgments. Where is the adjutant general centered? All requests, number two now, all requests by a county governing body that the governor declare an emergency shall be sent to the Office of Emergency Management. Wow, okay, that sounds similar since 9-11, right? I mean, that's all like almost like normal, it's the new normal. Let's go to the Office of Emergency Management. This is for counties now. But when an emergency comes in, it goes to the adjutant general to determine who's in power. That's their judgment. 
the, the determination of an emergency is based on the, maybe the governor of the county, but the judgment is based in the adjutant general. Who is this adjutant general? Well, let's just go to Merriam Webster's 1820, since 1828 website. And I say 1828 because most judiciaries have accepted that the 1828 Merriam Webster's is the official judicial uh, dictionary, notwithstanding whatever all else you, you all have heard. To my knowledge, it's still the Webster's 1828. And, Actually, Black's Law is not authority. And actually, Black's Law is more of a commercial dictionary as well. And you'll see that if you go through many years and read through many definitions. But let's go down to here. What is this? It's a chief administrative officer of an army who is responsible especially for the administration and preservation of personal records. Number two, the chief administrative officer of a major military unit, such as a division or corps. Do you remember those two words that I, division and corps, I talked about months and months ago? But this is a major military unit officer, exactly a general. You know, I keep telling you the attorney general is the civil general for this civil war that never ends. Uh, and a general meant something. Because they're not really in general laws anymore. They're in this occupying code and statute. But look more closely here. The notice goes to an adjutant general who judges who the officer in power is. So, it goes to a military officer. Let's go read what this office, excuse me, what was that? The Office of Emergency Management is. I just, folks, I'm just going down and putting terms in and doing searches from DuckDuckGo. I don't know, I don't approach any of this. Even though I've read all these statutes, I don't approach it because they can change like I know anything. I just use that basic foundational knowledge to guide me along quick, more quickly. You'll get that as soon as you read more. Where do I go? I go right to the uh, Oregon Office of Emergency Management, right? That's not hard to figure out. What's the first sentence? The Office of Emergency... Now, this, remember, you got you have a civil government, supposedly, that's supposed to be handling all this, correct? Let's see the definition of where, who makes judgments in this state. The o Oregon Office of Emergency Management is a division, I think military in this context as well, is a division of the Oregon Military Department. So I don't know how far everyone wants to go from the fact that the military still is an occupying force in this in this the United States of America. Everything go anything that's a judgment call goes through, and that uh, district officer determines how to maintain the the de jure law. Now, that's all said. That's not our problem. Because in this case, all they're doing is they're moving along on a need-to-know basis. When there's an emergency, the general needs to know. And you see the infrastructure in the statutes already doing that. That you'll you will never see unless I just told it to you, or you happen along like you just like we have a problem we want to solve. Not even the people in the county or even the governor might understand unless they're told, and I suppose they are, how that there's this special connection going on. It's already done. They just follow the rules, if you will. They follow what they're told. Under threat that the, in this regard, the attorneys would be saying, if you don't follow this code, you could find yourself in some serious trouble. In this case, they would be correct. But, confirming last week when I talked to you about, there's a, there's a fabric of military control written right into the code that makes it invisible to most everybody. This proof came up the next, the next, within a day, as I was helping someone do what they needed to do in trying to get a county to make the better decision against this proclamation, these emergency proclamations. So we see the statute that the governor is allowed to make these uh, determinations. Let me move you into something that we see. Now that, what was interesting to me is that I also knew that there was other proclamation powers. And the COVID, we would think, was a health problem, don't you think? You think that COVID, uh, the coronavirus, even if, if we, even if I don't challenge this as a fraudulent condition, a faux faux, even if I just agree for the moment, for the sake of argument, that it's something, do you think that this is a health emergency or not? Well, I think that any reasonable mind that's not meat deprived would say, yes, this is a health emergency. Would, I, would it surprise you to say that under the 401 statute, it doesn't say health, it just has emergency general? And yet in the state of Oregon, this is why you got to get specific to each state, because each state's going to be different. 
there's also a statute that says that there's a, a proclamation authority for a public health emergency. Now, where the statute says there's a specificity, they have to follow that. They're supposed to anyway. They're not, but that's what they're supposed to. And now this, is, this translates us into, okay, let's push the military back. That's just part of the fabric of the system that you live under. Didn't know, but there it was. More evidence. Now we move on. I want to address the nonsense we see in the nation relative to these governors and what they're doing, and how they're... No one is reading these black and whites to see how the emergencies are coming down and whether, again, you're living in... When they everybody heard indefinite detention, essentially, that this is going to go on, no one stopped and said, wait a minute, that's not possible under a law in the country, uh, the several states of the United States of America. I, I don't think anybody has. Well, I know, know somebody did. One more guy. One guy did. Anyway, proclamation of public health emergency is a thing additional to a general emergency declaration. Let me just touch this and go through. I don't have time to go through it. I won't read it uh, over and over and bore you to tears. You really do need to see the words here. You need to read how they put things together. You need to exercise that muscle. We need to get back to that educated masses that becomes act, engages this problem. Not just protests or complaints on the steps or now even at the door of the legislator's house. We have even more to do. And it's along the lines of what I told you the model was for Virginia's Constitution and, the, and their 13th uh, article over there for the Second Amendment. We're talking about maladministration. I add the idea that we sued in 2013. We add this in our lawsuit based on a cease and desist that we issued. It also, the suggestion came from the colleague I'm working with now. So this is longstanding working together trying to work out problems that we said there was inherent power in each branch of government to stop the excesses of another branch. I add that in because that sits there, and it will never be stated to you, but it sits there as an inherent, unenumerated power. Proclamation of Public Health Emergency in Oregon Law 433441. They have a specific uh, health emer public health emergency that power that comes through that they have the governor is supposed to follow. Let me offer, roll it on down if you're following. If you haven't found it yet, just when you get there, go down to number five. I just want to read and touch this. Every Republican form representative government underneath the Constitution and the laws has a limitation on the force and effect of government. And in fact, to enforce a, an emergency proclamation or police power, the statutes tell them, that each a power official who has that power, in, that they have certain things that they must show. Let me offer and jump the gun a little bit here. Putting down COVID or COVID pandemic isn't a must show. It doesn't conform with what's required in the black and white. The black and white, you copy and paste and say you didn't conform it. We're going to see an example that this is exactly how it says. Number five here on this, for a particular type of public uh, emergency proclamation, a health emergency, now removes the general emergency, at least the way I read this, and places certain restrictions for a particularized emergency considered a public health emergency. Why has these governors done general public health emergencies? And we see the evidence of the problem when we see that Oregon has one particularly for public health, and the governor didn't use that. You think that alone maybe invalidates all these orders? I think so. Anyway, we're pushing that, but we're again, I haven't talked about this that I've been working behind the scenes because I don't want to anticipate things that people may be listening that maybe try to anticipate and become an obstruction because we have that. We have the mass ignorance in the in the population, mass ignorance in the people that are even good people in the government trying to do their best, and then you have those people that are trying to advance the agenda. And that's the ones I'm more concerned with for anything. So you don't hear me talking about what's in the works for us, but now we're coming to the point when it's starting to come out. I want you to know what you have been missing, that you could have just written a little. All the time you have on your hands, you could have been just running this through right down the track and even just making letters asking, how is your orders lawful that I have to follow them when you exceeded this here, folks? Number five, a proclamation of a state of public health emergency expires when terminated by a declaration of the governor or no more than 14 days after the date of the public health emergency is proclaimed unless the governor expressly extends the pro proclamation for an additional 14-day period. Folks, let's give them, for the sake of that two dumbers, 
a little benefit of the doubt. 28 days. Let's ignore for the moment, I have never even heard an extension under the existing laws to extend a limited amount of time, let alone to 14 or 28 days. But let's just give them 28 days. Do you think that all these these executive public health orders have been issued longer than 28 days ago if we were to apply this just generally across the nation? I think we can say yes. Now, hold that out because we're going to have the general. There's a general limitation as well. But here's how easy it is to out that there's no force in effect. And remember, the emergency orders are implied implied to be lawful, and if you can find they're not, they're not. Why I've been telling you, you pull out all these things, put them in your bag of law, and when someone challenges you on any of these things, you just point out, well, this date says that when the proclamation went in, this statute says that it's out. It's no longer a force and effect. Now, I mean, there's more to say. You, If they want to press you, you have to go on to the next stuff about going to the felonies that are also in the statute that they're committing under the color of a lawful order that's not. Now, you, that's how you get to there real quick. But if you read, I'll read that in, no more than 14 days after the day of the public health emergency. So we see two things. One is we have a pu- supposed public health emergency that's not. So maybe coronavirus is not a health emergency. Maybe it's a general emergency. But there's a specificity to that, too. We have to find something to attach it to because this is limited form government that you're all supposed to be vigilant to make sure and ensure for yourselves. Otherwise, they do what you see. 14 days. If she declared a public health emergency, Oregon's got a woman, uh, a female a woman uh, governor, Brown. Interestingly, Brown was also in California, and I heard Brown's another st- another another state. At any rate, 14 days. Have you heard any order limited to 14 days in Oregon? No. Every one of them exceeds that. So they're killed right there for one thing. Now, I just wanted to point that out while I'm moving along. So here's also implying that the government, military, that got this notice, also had a duty to limit it as well they haven't. So now you have a systemic problem that you started. We're talking looking at the battlefield now. I'm not returning to the military. I'm saying there's officers involved that ought to have maintained order under law, and they're not. And I'd say that as well. The OSP, the Oregon State Police, they're not to be trusted either. Oh, boy, Finnicum comes to mind here and her work conspiracy with the, the governor's conspiracy with them to kill him. And I also have, we have letters explaining the problem of the governor relative to other things that she's done in excess to the state police, and they will not respond. So you have to look at the battlefield here. This would speak to Michigan as well. Why you have to start having papers and notices to all these officials. It sounds like a lot of work, but once you get the, once you get the short letter, once you get the short notice of the maladministration, that's a simple thing to do. Let's get back. 14 days. This is for this state. You've got to be very careful. I found out New York, folks in New York, you need to really change your laws about the extent of an emergency. However, I did find a, minima, a minimization statute there, and they're easy to find. I don't know anything about New York law, but I found the limitation. It's not as short as 14 days, but it's still a limitation that brings these executive orders out of, as I called it, shelf life. They have Their shelf life expires. 14 days for a public health emergency, but this governor didn't call it that. So, is COVID actually a public health problem? By her order, no. And so I'd have to ask her, what if it's not a public health issue that was limited to 14 days, then what is it? And though this is what you get to do when you start seeing the black and white. I'm not making anything up. I just read it to you. There's a limit of 14 days. There had to be an extension, expressly extends the proclamation for an additional 14-day period. Period. There's no other time. Again, under a Republican form representative limited government, it's the exposure to a disaster is to be mitigated quickly, temporary. And when you heard the word indefinite or kicking the can down the road on keeping you locked down, that was your evidence you were dealing with criminals, however you want to characterize that. So 14 days on a public health emergency that's not issued, that gives you the question, give me the question, if it's not a public health emergency, if COVID-19 pandemic is not, a public health issue, what the heck is it then? Yeah? You get that? You see how this works? You see how they're doing this to you? So simple. Right on the face, they're wrong. All these people do this contrary to the law. And the law, I'm telling you, is the black and white that's already there to show you limitations. Okay? 
So you have a thing you can do. Every state, you got to look at every state law. Con- look at the statutes first. Then you go to the Constitution. Now, I can't remember where I'm going to be touching that, but the Constitution on a general power in Oregon, I think it's Section 10. It's Article 10, Section 6. You'll see on a general declaration of emergency, it's 30 days. Isn't that interesting that the public health emergency has a declaration time and a one-up time of 28 days, how close that is to the 30, to continue the limited uh, exposure to people and the power of the governors to shut stuff down. But shut stuff down limited to the constitutional constraints. If you all don't know what they are, then you're going to be locked down and be the corona kids and the and live the cricketude and just be complainers and protesters. You're not going to take the action required of a free, if you will, free people. And so what takes action, it takes outpouring of action. And I've, I've told you, this is really a great opportunity. Everyone's got no other time to do but to really focus on this stuff. And I'm wondering when that's, that swell of attack is coming the, the swarm, the hornet swarm that's coming out to do to do things like this, uh, which you see does start to work. The impression of the natives getting restless or beyond is a constraining force on any occupying force. And you know they're an occupying force when they stopped following the objective basis that existed. They're trying to extend their power. It's up to you to shut them down. That's international law. You have to, you have to throw out the occupiers. The guidance that you use, as I reflected through Virginia Constitution, was that maladministration you can point out. If they continually do things in excess of their authority, they're in the obligation and duty to recognize that authority before the fact. You have them in maladministration right there. If you have the other other branches of government not stepping up to say, wait a minute, and I would consider the military department a whole other branch. Actually, the branch of judgment in the state you think is de de jure, and it's even beyond de facto, but before that, then you you see the failure and dereliction of duty of all these officers is the delineation of maladministration, at least the Virginia Constitution of which is very simple to extract out the remedy you're going to start to use. But you get out and just, as in mass, as you see, Huntington Beach, the cops can't deal with all that. But that's my problem with that is we're going to, that's the wrong way to go to stop the parasites inside. We're not stopping the termites inside to feel good that people protesting in places in numbers is going to solve this. Uh, but it does solve certain things. And one thing that came to the forefront, police cancel drone spying showing resistance to COVID-19 police state works. Uh, there's a story here. America is uh, concurrently in utter turmoil. That's us, folks. I just tell you, that's us. We're we're allowing it. After panic buying and empty shelves across the country, millions of unemployed people began spending their last dollars. We all know about this. The cops are using Chinese now uh, patrol drones to monitor citizens 24 hours a day. In ma- in a matter of weeks, America has has shifted uh, from the land of the free to the land of the economic collapse and newly ushered in police state. Folks, did you just hear uh, in at least one state that the extent of the lawful order for an emergency only goes to 14 in the absence of an extension? We, I told you, though I didn't read it, the Constitution under a general power of emergency only goes 30 days. All of what was just said in the starting of that is on the people for allowing it. And you see when you put a resistance, the occupiers back off. As the title said, the police brought this in. People were offended by it in such a, the, uh, such a way that the police had to back off. And this goes on in a time when a good news is sparse, any shred of of it uh, can be inspiring. This is also an implied problem for my mind. The shred of news that the police backed off is not what you want to hear. They have to be defeated in their intention to do it in the future. There has to be accountability brought for that happening in the first place. So I'm reading on here, such as in the case in the Westport, Connecticut, in which resistance to police state has paid off when the citizens of Westport expressed their anger to the city's plan to use drone technology to spy on citizens by making sure 
They are adhering to social distancing guidelines. Two days later, the program was shut down. That's great, but they didn't argue that the executive orders were faulty. Now, if they're not out of time, now you're forced to go examine whether or not COVID could be a thing to invoke the police power, as I've explained in past broadcasts. For now, today I'm saying, we'll just accept that the valid, that there's a cause invoking the emergency power. The statutes say they're in excess of authority because they've run their shelf life out. But if you stand up, see, you have to, you can use that now to stand up. Here it says if you stand up, you see the government pull back. So your act, your, I guess part of this broadcast is your interact, your proper interaction. In this case, anger worked. I, I'm suggesting that's not really enough. The anger to back them off, but now you go after who actually instituted and you actually start putting controls on the excess that these people have now exposed to you they're willing to do. I think this is a perfect opportunity to see these excesses, the stuff that's been festering underneath that they've been waiting to get. We're now seeing it. I've told you this over and over again. This is a great time in a way. I told you I'm kind of excited. I'm not excited that no one's responding quite right. And the step, the next step is realizing the black and white, even if you, whether you look at it as an occupier or not, the black and white has in it the limitations, in other words, the proof of any excesses that you can rely on, and every officer of that state has to rely on it. And if they don't, you just have another criminal. That's a different problem. But with the numbers I see, see, that's what I told you about Virginia. This is why it's kind of escalated now. When we missed our attempts all through the last 20 years, the hindsight 2020, we now are required to bring the uh, the, the masses together. Not fight amongst ourselves, uh, but uh, the evidence right there is, is, uh, is, is in the black and white, ready for us to use if we would just do it. And what I'm finding, uh, just to, so those of you to know, what I'm finding, what I found and what we find, as I said very earlier, there's a mass of ignorance in the government and in the people, even good nature, good people in the government. There just is a lack of understanding that even this is even here, or when they were supposed to respond, or what they were supposed to say. So now, though we've been pressing this, it's taken weeks for this to filter through. And that's another type of problem. And so when I saw the delay, I, I went back, and that's how I, I, I focused on this, because you're dealing with people that just can't believe there's no cause. And I said, okay, for people like that, you have to you have to be able to step back and find a failure, even if they believe it's real, even though it's not. They don't want to respond. You have to answer that. So we go to that step today. Even if it's real, let's just go ahead and give it to them. These are real. They are in excess of their shelf life by the black and white. Defeats the lawfulness of those orders. And if you start delineating that, whether you do that for yourself with a bag of law, as I told you to put together, or you do it the next step where you go by yourself if you have to, to make a letter and even question the validity of these to get the record being mailed, or you just move in like you see Michigan and you have the guns in the background saying, listen, we could do this or we could do this hard. You can do it the soft way or the hard way. I really don't want to see the hard way. But what you're doing is you're telegraphing your earnest, and then you hand them the documents that puts them all underneath the scrutiny is what I'm saying the next step is. You can do it with these black and whites, like you should be doing it now. Another state, Governor Mills extends statewide stay-at-home order uh, to May 31st. Now, we're just entering into May. We're just, isn't that amazing? How many months already, folks? And uh, this is a 31-day. For those of you in Maine, you really, if you look at your statutes, you may or may not have a complaint. If her order comes by COVID-19, you now have to go to the fact that COVID doesn't isn't a cause. The symptoms of the common cold, conflated to be seasonal flu symptoms, is not a cause. And that's why you start seeing people say, well, quarantine is, is, a, is a sickness. Quarantining unsick people is jail. That's the problem. That's exactly the point. As I told you, the beach. You've got to close the beach because the beach was the vector. When the, when the soldier, the retired soldier stands on the beach in the water and gets the government to open the beach, there was no cause on the beach. And so we got to refocus on what the cause is, why the statutes say you can't just declare something without support. And that's why I went to earlier and told you COVID is just mere symptoms, cannot be a cause. 
and there is no test. You have no way to assess. And there's obligations to assess. All right, so if their determination had no ability to assess, the governor couldn't even under general proclamation do what she's told to do or he is told to do underneath the underneath the um, the directive by the legislature to the executive to determine. And once you see the exactness of this, you can those are just simple line statements to bring out. Governor Mills extends statewide stay at home. These people, these people are going nuts. Now it's I told you the governors, and this is all fueled partly by the money. In fact, the local county is that that, uh, that I'm finding uh, trying to help with. Uh, they're uh, uh, concerned they're not going to get paid because of one of these insane governors is kind of hold the money that they got. And I've understood it's up to a billion dollars now to do all this. And none of you, none of you made claims against that either. It's kind of astonishing to me. Uh, when they locked you down, every statute says they got to pay you for the property they stole under the lockdown. Did any of you make a claim because your property was locked down and you need to be compensated on the state or else it take unlawful takings? No, I heard nobody. I'm suggesting it as many people as I can. Do your claims. What's it going to hurt? Better better than a bailout money at $1,200. It's useless. They're actually having to show that they had to pay pay for your property. Now they got to justify how they did it. And, and then you're standing there saying, no, it was done under color, a color of authority. That was actually a felony. That's not a takings. And the people that I know that are, have known that write paper, like, that write lawsuits and do these all these vast affidavits, you're sitting in the prime space right now. You go to the black and white, and not to go out there and stick your chin out. No, you start pouring the embarrassment on these people. Granted, you need probably more people, but it doesn't mean you're not going to be effective. You find locally a couple people in a county, and you start pointing this out to them, and they're good people, and they're going to work through the what I call the bureaucratic goo, and things happen. That's how we get things to done. That's how we got the smoke ordinance. The, well, it ended up being a plan in the, the, the a plan in their land management plan to go into effect, cut all the smoke out because cut all the fires out. Fire season. That's how that worked, folks. So you just have to read in and see where these things are. There's limits to this stuff. If you won't call them out, you deserve what you get. I'm not happy with that at all, but that's what the proof is. That's what goes on. So another governor says, stay at home. All right? The stay at home orders you're going to find out are really. Even where they're supposed to be working, you look at what they say. They're relevant only in the statutes to the government facilities and government things. You're impliedly saying you're government property as well, on top of it all. But anyway, Governor Janet Mills announced her administration's plan to gradually and safely restart Maine's economy on Tuesday. The statewide stay-at-home order is extended to May 31st. Did anybody in Maine go and look and see the statute limitations on that or whether or not it could be properly stated that way as a proclamation? Whether she could actually come up with the determination that she made if I take Oregon standards as a, as a reference. And I say that well because I'm going to go here moving on to New York and those are all sitting there too. We hear a lot about Cuomo out there but nobody is really referencing the law. Everyone just references the harm. And guess what? You've handed that determination. The statute says the governor has that determination. Why do you continue to hand it to them by not challenging the ability to have a determination? And so this comes up with a, it was an older Twitter that uh, came through. Someone posted uh, was a, an account called Anna Cap Quotes. Like an uh, anarchy, anarcho capitalism quotes uh, from a gentleman named Frederick Nietzsche. Everything the state says is a lie, and everything it has was sto it has stolen. And it was interesting in my feed. The very well, really closely next, the next post was from another of uh, the Free Thought Project, and they showed a picture, and it said the evils of government are directly proportionate to the tolerance of the people. So I sent that back in answer to the first quote of Nietzsche, and it's because of y'all allowing it. And so I thought that was pointed. I had come through. It just came through my feed as, as you know, as, as arbitrary as it would come through. And I said, once some, somebody's making a quote, sounds noble and all that good, because maybe that's all the truth. I don't necessarily think it's the truth properly used when you look at what I talk about with the obligations and duties. But every excess is allowed. Those evils are allowed by the tolerance of the people. And when you're crickets, that's a high, high tolerance. 
I don't know what else to say. And yet, here we have today black and white showing that there's a way to address this foundationally and substantially as a better way than just, as we see, just going ahead and protesting. The, the laws are unlawful. If those are criminals in the office. They need to be arrested. I know it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. And if you don't, the tolerance of that allows the very thing and your consent to have the robber robbing your stuff. What's the complaint is what I've been asking all this time. The black and white offers a measure in these times of occupation. Now we can see the occupation and the invaders offers you the only objective basis, good or bad, the only objective basis that we have to set a foundation that they actually can't touch, that they can be outed immediately. If I understand, if I can read a constitutional limitation on a governor's right of proclamation to destroy all your rights by proclamation, and it comes out and says this is for 60 days, do you think that's valid on its face? And if it's not, where's your, where's your, where's your challenge? Where did you run down and challenge the county to have a challenge? Or your city to have a challenge? And nail these people with the obligations and duties. Make your government function. Because you're in a prison if you don't. And you're, and you're not going to be doing anything anyway. You might as well get, make yourself effective and actually enforce the civics they told us was required by a people that you better, you have a, a republic to keep. You're all hope, pressing the republic, keep the bare arms, but you won't keep the, the civil government. It's pretty fascinating to me. But anyway, Apple data shows shelter in place is ending whether the government wants it to or not. Great. But that's not going to solve our problem. Uh, the other thing is, as soon as more and more people do this and the government kind of loses this, it's going to get us back down to being complacent and tolerant. Because we didn't take the moment we had. Listen, if you're out down there in the city, in the, at the legislators, and you're on their front door and no one's getting arrested, that pretty well proves a problem. And that self-evident proof that you don't or need to be down there instead of in your house, is all I can say. And not confronting uh, singularly an uh, IQ-80 cop either. That's not smart. That's not smart. Th while they have the errors happening, while they have the excesses of the code happening, that's where you, you grab them by the throat until they're dead. You don't give up. You shake them and shake them and shake them until they're done. Now, I'm not seeing any of that. Yeah, it's great walk in the... I've asked you to get past the steps, get in the, get in the building. But you don't stand around. Okay, so it's a, I agree, but I don't agree to the limitation of the, your own limitation when there's much more to do. Apple data shows shelter in place is ending. Great, people are starting to get out and get tired of it, but that's a different dynamic that I'm not so sure is such a good deal. And I, some people would say, well, what the heck's the problem with that? Because we have a problem that festers still. And what have I been talking about? Uh, breaking armed protesters about the Michigan armed protesters storm Michigan Capitol as politicians in bulletproof vests vote on extending lockdown. Why? Because the, the protesters came in with the uh, guns, uh, which is their right. Not, I don't see a problem with any of that. But you see the you see the intimidation that the legislators now feel that they're going to be a target. Now, no one got shot. No one did anything like that. Really good. But when you went to the front door, it talks about how this worked out. Michigan voters have had enough. Only the voters, folks? You see how they twist all this? Those voters are actually federal franchisees. And all of you all in Michigan let yourself be called that. You weren't the posterity. Okay, you see, the, you see these stories, but there's not a truth here either. There, there's a truth that they tell us, but not the one that they're promoting, uh, uh, that you uh, see in your eyes and you don't really, you don't realize how programmed you are. Uh, my Michigan voters have had enough of their tyrannical government uh, and governor. Is it theirs? I don't know. I mean, but uh, so, it, 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 even so, armed protesters stormed the Capitol on, t on Thursday as the politicians were voting in bulletproof vests to extend the lockdown orders. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'll move on to the next one. Michigan, okay, so that's what happened. They stopped them at the gate. The sergeant at arms stopped them at the doors. The, the state police were there to stop them from going in, and they did, and everything was peaceable enough, you know, the protest. And yet nobody in that group handed the demands that I'm saying you have to expose to the sergeant at arms to execute to the to the legislators and then to the state police to go at, to go demand the arrest of the governor that exceeded their power and violated your, your all your rights. 
And what are those rights? We're going to get to that too. It's real simple. One statement out of one court case, just the infringement on your liberty was enough. Just that. Then look at all the other things they've got going that they've destroyed in you. And so what the people do when they go in Michigan is they don't do the next step, which would have forced the hand of the Michigan legislators. What they do, though, when they didn't do that, the legislators pick it up because they have a, apparently a Republican majority. They then use that as the infamous from the from the uh, tar and feather crowd and the tor pitchforks and torch crowd right outside the door to invigorate a bill to go after that governor. Michigan legislature gives Republicans authority to file new lawsuit against Governor Whitmer over a coronavirus lockdown. Permission? Authority? Give? Political party? This is not the answer, folks. They had an inherent power to execute against the governor. has nothing to do with the lawsuit in the judicial branch. That's the same power you would be invoking as you bring it to them. Because you also have, if you look at the Virginia example, the posterity has an alternative that they can threaten the legislature if the legislature doesn't fix this, not by lawsuit, but by direct action, that the people still have the power to fix it. Because if you look, as I explained what I read, to, what I read in the Constitution, where the Constitution fails to keep that limited form government, the people have an independent right. It doesn't count on the judiciary. It doesn't count by any establishment of government. That's what failed with all the greatness of walking up the steps and into the building. That's what fails in Michigan. That's what fails everywhere. So the, now you handed it, because you didn't put your demand, you hand the Michigan legislature, which is a politics now. It's a game here. Now, it's not over. Michigan, go back in. But now hit all the departments. Go back to my broadcast. Not to hear my voice. Go back and listen how simple it is to delineate how this maladministration affects you, how it's not a voter that's talking. It's the constitutional posterity that's protecting itself against three branches that failed to keep that limited form government. And here's how. Here's the statutes that they, that they violated. Is that really so hard to understand? I, I'm, I'm trying to think. I get all these people say they don't understand what I'm saying. I'm like making it too complicated. And thank you for those of you that reckon I'm trying to, I think of uh, the Effin Network, Australia, thank you. I mean, I'm trying to keep it between the lines here a bit, too, not too technical and not too simplistic, because this is serious stuff. We weren't supposed to be in a point in our society that this was too complicated, and that it is as a, is a, is a fact. And that we have to rise up our own. This is us again. And so, Michigan was great. And Musco, thank you. I know. You're right. They went up to the steps. You you recognize that. But I'm looking at this thing with that's all they did. See, there's always the thing you fail to do until the thing is fixed. In this case, falling short gives the pol political branches time to play with it. This thing needs to be over now, not through a lawsuit. They didn't need permission, actually. The authority didn't need to be given to a political party. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of wrong right sitting in that title. I don't know if, it, if people picked up on it. I'll tell it to you today. That's not what you want to see happening. When you see that happening, something's gone wrong. You've done it wrong. And it's not wrong a judgment. It's that, that you have to turn around and do it right. It's the obligation on an occupied people. And if you're not occupied, do justify your lockdown to me. And Grimner wants to say lock up because it's more like prison. Well, lockdown is, is really, to me, a riot in a prison. Lock up, to me, also, I agree with the lock up. It says it's prison, but that's, see, the word up is too optimistic. So I'm more, it's a lockdown. So that's my only relative to Grimner's assertion that we should be staying locked up because it's prison. Well, this is more a prison riot, and they're going to have us locked down. Besides, up is too too optimistic, and we're not there. So. If I have a voice to say on that, I know, not much importance. It's really important that we figure out what to do more than to keep recognizing that we're in it. Uh, some governors are getting serious about costs of coronavirus lockdowns. Some aren't. This is an interesting thing for me in the, in the so-called no the news, the notice. This tells you that the determination of the governor you see ha Oregon governors have in statute, that, th that they have this determination, go find it in your statute. Go understand what those emergency statutes say. Go look at the statute and the Constitution, because there's two different authorities in there. This is how they've also kind of split our minds. 
We don't quite understand how to track down each one, and you really got to keep specific to each one when you speak on that side. You can also use, the, as I showed you, the dichotomy. If COVID-19 isn't a public health emergency, which a state delineates must be a public health emergency, then what the heck is it? Well, it must be what the UN said is all I can say. One of the things, it's not a health emergency. It's a crisis they're not going to let go to waste, and they're going to impose their Green New Deal, as I've been telling you, is coming down. It's these people. This Brown is one of these people. Remember, that's the compact states that don't have a constitution right at all to make federal constitution right as, as much to make interstate compacts. And yet we sued in 2013 because they actually were making a compact to provinces in Canada. These people are internationalists by the way they work. Where did we find that out? Also, I showed you that link. It comes out of Canada. This is a think tanks coming out of Canuckistan. Thank you very much for all you up there, too. Appreciate it. All you listeners. And the engage, and that you engage. I appreciate all that. I don't know. Again, we could come together on some of this, but we do have that cross-border problem. I think finding the limits is what's going to be important. And I tell them to you all the time. Some governors are getting serious about some not. Why aren't some not? And then you find out, you, uh, they, and you even go in the ones, I think Elon Musk is saying, great for Texas. I think I looked at some of theirs. Again, these emergency orders all appear to be faulty, as I've been telling you. And a lot of them, if you don't want to challenge the COVID, is, an, is not a thing, a demonstrable thing, even violate their statutory lim statute limitations. If you have other states, like let's say Oregon, that never declared a 14-day limit and then extended it, every one of those that should have been a public health order is invalid. And they can only enforce on valid orders. And if you look very carefully in the code, you'll, in the statute, you'll see that it's re obviously, you would think, obviously it says it in there, impliedly, they have to be valid orders. And this is what you see extended to the agencies. And so there's a duty there as well. I mean, guys, if you look at limited for government and you really understand how to read, you start seeing there's limits all over, but we sit as crickets in our houses complaining that there's no quarantine, being quarantined, thinking it's a championship to get a whole neighborhood out on a beach. Instead of turning around and went right into City Hall and said, listen, we're throwing you bombs out. Here's, here's your demand. Here's your maladministration. Fix it now. Or you're out of here. You're out of here because we're, we're helping you out. And we're helping you out by our constitutional power to do so. You didn't follow your statutes. And I say that particularly your instead of saying your occupier statutes. Okay? But it'd be better to try and follow some local thing to bring some modicum of, of peace by actually engaging the sheriffs, I think, locally. Whether they would or not, that becomes a, whether they want to press against malfeasance themselves, nonfeasance or whatever, all these other feasance things, these things that they had an obligation and duty to do that aided and abetted a crime against the people when they didn't. The omission to act is just as big the felony. So we have this, in, uh, to me, some governors are getting serious about cost of coronavirus lockdown, some aren't. To me, in a way, the costs uh, should never have been there because the orders were all invalid. The, then that's if we agree that they're there. They're, the shelf life has expired. They were never made temporary, never intended to. And I can't say across the board that I can't have. I don't have the time and energy to go look at every state. I'm knowing that the words that come out of the worst states are the ones I seem to focus on to try and find some stuff for y'all to say. Look at. I don't know anything about that state, but it took me 10 minutes to find some of this information that you too can use where you live. Because I I believe there's a limit, whether or not we are experiencing it. Obviously, you see the lunatics, and apparently vegetarians out there in the seats of power that don't believe they have anything that constrains them. And what did I say before? The Twitter. The government stole everything? Well, it must be from a tolerant people. That's on us. I've been telling you it's on us. No matter who is in enforcing effects, whether it's de jure or not. And moving on, the tyranny. We're staying in Oregon now because a lot of stuff came through. <laughs> all, all showing it's it's invalid on its face and nobody says a thing. And I, I say nobody, but I know we're working on it, but we only have so many lines of communication to try and move some things through. And time. And validity, we've already challenged the COVID. We put it in. It's still being sitting there festering. We put all the stuff I've told you out there. It's in the system working relative to a local area, trying to carve out a place that the COVID can't exist to eliminate also 
the fact of the territorial wide, statewide infringement. And so it's important that you also have counties that say, we've done an assessment as the health authority. We've, well, if your count, if your statutes say that they are a health authority, they do say that in Oregon, uh, that the health authority of the county has made the assessment and goes that we don't find the emergency here. And if there was one, we are capable to handle it. As soon as you say that, the extension of the declaration, the general declaration ceases. Okay? It's that simple. You just got to get people to see the truth of everything, the facts, the black and white. Someone has to tell an ignorant populace. A tyranny. Oregon Governor Kate Brown extends lockdown to July 6th, despite ranking 40th on a state of coronas, coronavirus list with 104 deaths in state of 4 million. I answered a Twitter that somebody came out and said, oh, that actually said that it was the ranking 40th. I say the, the ranking is irrelevant, folks. Did you hear anything about a ranking in their ability to determine a declaration, whether it be a public health no, uh, emergency or not? No, the ranking is irrelevant, but that makes big news. It's irrelevant. You can't focus on the deaths, whatever the numbers are, or the ranking. It has to do with whether there's a particular emergency that the governor can call upon. And then whether or not they've made the list explaining what that thing is. Right? So six weeks of, uh, see, several states reopened at least partially on a Friday, May 1st, after the six-week-long Fauci lockdown. Remember, Fauci means to fall prey to. That's irrelevant as well. This, this story here is really kind of fascinating. It's lots of irrelevance to it. But it is telling us that the, this governor in Oregon, this lunatic, she must be a vegetarian. She's completely insane. Locking down the state till July 6th. Pretty fascinating. I just told you, that under a general order, even if we don't look at this as COVID-19 as a health, evidence, a health emergency, the Constitution limits the power to 30 days. Where do you get that? Well, because the statute says her power is limited by codes and statutes and Constitution. All right, so I bring up again the proclamation of health emergency, pointing out that if it's a health emergency, it should only be two weeks. The shelf life is over in two weeks. This is not even an extension, it seems. So she calls it an extension, which means she has to relate back in time to when the first emergency date was made, doesn't she? And she has to have an authority in law to, in order to make the extension valid. And I'm selling, telling you that these, val these orders can be existent and be invalid. In other words, there is no force and effect in them if you put your bag of law together to show that there's a break in the chain of authority. A chain of title, chain of authority. New York's got one. I just identified it. If, even if I agreed that he did every, Cuomo did everything right, he's got a break in his chain of authority by two days. Fascinating. You just got to read it. I'll come to that in a second. So we got this lunatic governor out in Oregon going to go for two more months. What's the authority? I don't know. She just makes the claim. They claim COVID pandemic or whatever COVID. It's I don't I still don't know. And that COVID pandemic, that thing started creeping in. That got me thinking about something else. We're going to get to that. So terminations of state of emergency. The governor shall terminate the state of emergency by proclamation when the emergency no longer exists or when the threat of emergency has passed. So now she's in malfeasance for not declaring something that she couldn't find in the beginning. And if you just printed that black and white, printed that, copy and paste it, and stay so, and then now you essentially do have to, well, in this case, you would just show that on its face, 60 days is counter to 30 days of the Constitution limitation. Further, given it's a pro, she's made a general proclamation, it's not a health emergency. If it were determined to be a, a health emergency, it would only exist for 14 days. Can anybody do this? It's, all every state has this susceptibility that it's that the statutes declare this. And I hear a bunch of people stuck in their houses or thinking it's a great thing to be able to walk on the beach in numbers, the herd that she is. Okay? The state of emergency proclaimed by the government may be terminated at any time by joint resolution of legislative assembly. In statute, they actually have to direct the legislative assembly to do what's an inherent power under the Constitution. Isn't this fascinating how stupid people people have become? Let's look at this. So your legislators can just declare it by joint resolution. Now here's the problem. All these West, what are they, left coast states, leftist coast states, whatever, they're all Democratic, almost majorities. 
And this is where you start seeing the power of the colonial state Virginia's constitution say when all that fails, when the political powers rest, political powers, the parties and the foreign invaders finally rest, uh, rescue from the republic, you still have pro a legal, peaceful remedy. That's what, that's what Virginia says. If you just agree with it, just answer through. And so, the termination of the state of emergency can happen by the governor, but it now has to go to the general power in the Constitution. What I say it was Article 10 or Section 6 or, or Section 10, Article 6, whatever. You'll find it. You can read through the stuff. They're in the Constitutions. There's limits to police power. There's limits to be able to, to take away your rights. You can't remain silent when they do. A fa uh, an order that's facially longer than it's supposed to be or missed directed is a non-lawful order. Whether you want to take it a step or two beyond to challenge that or more officially, I guess that's up to you. I don't know if I felt the, if I'd feel comfortable trying to argue that with an IQ 80 cop that already agrees that they've got a job to do. So I'm getting over here to Brown's lock time, lockdown is over. This is another report that came out. Somebody you'll read did some research I say thanks to Jed F for a Facebook group, Save Oregon follower, did some research by himself and an attorney. He warns you assume the risk of actions you take based on this information. I want you to go through this and read. This is another guy that found about the constitutional limitation. This is a guy that, with an attorney, finds that there's an excess already going on. Now, he throws out the caution. To me, it's not a caution. The, 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 you, either, you are either in fear of your government or you're or you're actually causing them to fear that they got something going to bite them. And if you don't do that, if you go to the legislature and don't let go past the doors or don't hand the sergeant at arms who has the, the duty to pass the notice on, the notice of their uh, liability if they don't act, and then your reassertion of the right as the posterity where they fail their inherent power, then you haven't instructed your government how to best handle an emergency they prove they're incapable of. So this is a proof, if you don't believe me, follow this guy's proof. It even has a, an attorney, an attorney's uh, agreement that there's a, an excess going on already. And this is my problem with the Bar Association. They know this. They're also an agency of the state. Why aren't they stepping up and, and talking? Why? What's going on here? Why has failed completely? Well, you'll find it's the Bar Association itself anyway, but they're one of the occupiers. But notwithstanding that, you can point out these black and white things. Even one of the members of the bar find there's a problem. Uh, I'm telling you, don't look at the hesitation. Just find out how you identify in your state. Everybody's got to just do this where you live. It takes a few minutes to go do some searches anymore on the computer. It's really fascinating how fast you can find this down, uh, how to track this down. Literally, I think New York, I, and New York's website was the worst to go through. I couldn't find anything. I actually have to go off-site and still got my answer in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, for them, for New York. Anyway, Executive Order 2024 is the new two-month-long. Facially, this is a violation of law. It's not a lawful order. Why is everybody convinced that this is something to per be persuaded by or the law enforcement of the state can actually listen to? Anybody who agrees to these lawful orders, these orders that are facially unlawful, is derelict in their duty and they can be given a notice and Thousands and millions of y'all locked up in quarantine can be standing in their face whether or not you use a, whether or not you wear a mask, whether whatever your opinion on that is, and you can be handing them in mass all your petitions and or demands to do the law or get out of the office, or we'll have to handle it. Now, why do I partly say that, and what are the limits? are written and they're recognized. Uh, Gary L. sent me a link to a judgment in Virginia, no less, regarding a gun uh, shooting range indoor that was outlawed from opening its doors and did a lawsuit. I think I reported on that, and I said that that time this looks like it's they're going to win uh, that, and I think this is the story that comes back, and in fact the judge found that the exception to things that keep and bear arms attaches to, like training. So now we see it a diff. You didn't believe me about the acquisition of property means you have other things, and to keep and bear means to be able to keep proficient and all that. Here's a court case. You'll get in the links that a judge in Virginia agrees that when the statute said that the governor could not close the training uh, gun training uh, shooting range, that it meant that it couldn't do it. 
And so if you're looking at what I'm saying over the last hour here, or hour and a half, hasn't had some authority, this little case here, the answer from the judge is that the statute is what is regarded, which I said to Gary surprised me a bit, but actually that was, a, like I said, my adjectives are not so accurate. I know exactly why they don't, they look at the statute before they look at the Constitution. You think the Constitution would be enough, but they didn't, he, the judge doesn't do that. He looks at the statute first. I said I was surprised they didn't just use the statute. It's a quicker angle to get at the answer. But the judge doesn't do that. They go through the statute. Which, why I keep telling you, use those statutes, even though they don't seem to be the, the, the most direct route, because it, it's impliedly an occupying force who is given the first opportunity to comply with the jour law. In this case, they couldn't. You'll see that what's important about this order is uh, the discussion that goes on by the judge in the case of what extent the governors will go to to try and justify a clearly violative statutory violation, not a constitutional violation at this point, clearly violating the clear, express, written, printed, black and white, to show you the kind of animal, insane animal, rabid animal, you're up against, which I've, I've found more important, I guess, than my surprise. But why I understand about, the, I wasn't really surprised, although I'm surprised, was I was hoping the Constitution, where the judge in the second article of Virginia Constitution the judge is a trustee of the people, would utilize that authority to get right to the Second Amendment instead of going through the establishment statutes of whatever occupation. So just to clarify that, I wasn't really surprised, but I was I was hoping, I guess, that the Constitution would be front and center where the Constitution also says that the judge is a trustee of the people. We don't have to regard the statutes when there's a clear violation of the Constitution. And so I'm a little surprised at that. I'll say it that way. But I, I think I know why. It's evidence that you live in an occupied country. But this harm was so, so blatant. It was self-evident that you can't, you'll see a ju the governors will, if you have a question, the governors will violate clearly printed law. There was an express exception to not do what they did, and they did it anyway, and then they tried to justify it. You need to see this thing. You need to understand that's what we're up against in this country. And you need to understand when you don't fight it, you tolerate it. And so the that the government stole it to me, stole your property, that's, I don't know what to say for you. You let it. And so my response to uh, Gary was good on this on this issue with the judge and uh, Second Amendment rights relative to training. They expl Actually, the judge comes out with an interesting discussion. New gun owners wouldn't have a place to train, and that was a that was a harm to the public. Now, I assume they use the word public in the context of people, but I don't know. I don't know about the judge. The judge thinks about that. It doesn't matter. There was an interesting addition: people who don't have to be aren't trained need to be trained. And there was, notwithstanding the fact that the the Trump had already said that was not going to be touched, and why would he even have to say it? That that he said something shows you you, you live in a country that's changed. The insane are literally running this asylum, and you've allowed it to be an asylum. So I answered to Gary on this, reading the, the, the rule, good, I'm surprised a, a limit had to be in the statute. In other words, he referenced the statutory statement that limited the governor's power. And that's what my, I'm surprised they went to that limit and not the constitutional. And I said, forgetting for the moment there is no test for COVID-19 and no way to demonstrate any exigency, you may find governors are violating the other provisions of their emergency powers as well, such as length of time and extent of territory. And I said that here a while back, and then now in anticipation of today's, not really, well, I, that's why I'm talking about it today. It's time, I think the time has come to start pointing out, it's not just that there was a statute that said you can't close a, you can't close a store, but see, everybody's being harmed by this, and there should be, and there is no valid basis. But you look at past, that there is no test, no COVID-19, look at the statutory basis. The governors are exceeding the black and white of their statutory power. And that's what you attack. You just don't, there's no opinion here. There's nothing you have to worry about. It's already mandated by the legislature the extent of the executive power. And it's constitutional. Right? And I say that, I hesitate. Do you know, did you follow up with, did you say, well, where that's lawful? See, you got you can always challenge this stuff. Continue depends on how what your insight is. It's constitutional as long as it's constitutional, isn't it? And so along with this came 
What was interesting, the Virginia decision came out that Gary found by searching around. Then this story comes up just after. And what was interesting about the SCOTUS punts, SCOTUS punts, the Supreme Court of the United States punts, you think they'd be doing justice, folks, not playing football. Kavanaugh sends Second Amendment signal. Alito dissent explains why. And what was interesting in this story here on the Internet was that they actually used the training aspect as a part of their reasoning in the case that the government was doing a fancy footwork and they didn't like it. So they're coming out to say, we might, we might actually entertain, instead of punt, kicking this can down the road, we might actually make a decision based on these things, and we're already agreeing uh, that there's a right to train. We're already agreeing to some of these underlying things, which we had just heard in the Virginia, I had just read in the Virginia d- judge's uh, decision uh, to uh, maintain an injunction against the governor for the imposition of that law. Now you see how you, what your, ang- your remedy is, the remedy of injunction against the imposition of the law, uh, and that the reasoning of training is one thing that the SCOTUS is now seeing is it needs to be protected as well, as they also decide, which I was a little bit surprised to see, and we did see this, that they're going to decide this. Maybe maybe they'll be deciding whether or not you actually have the right to open ca- carry outside in public and not just in your in your house, like the Heller case, and there's another one they mentioned. They're claiming in this story that the Heller, dis- Heller and another, dis- McDonald, I think it was, are being misinterpreted by the courts. Now, that's not a surprise to me either. The, the district courts are notorious criminals. I know people maybe just think I'm throwing all these guys under the bus and not. there's one that's out there that's good. They're not, folks. I've already told you about the territorial problem as well. Anyway, so this is an interesting correlation to the Virginia case. Uh, and the clear uh, proof, if you just read it, you'll see how the government, the people in government don't care what the black and white is and why it's even more important that you take importance. And you just, now it's easy, folks. It's, you don't have to go through the machinations. When there's a time limit and they've exceeded that time limit, it's done for them. It's perfect for you. It's a matter of putting a record down to see how people see it. And I think the more people that see it, they're going to realize how, how off the chain this thing really is. And now you can also ask them whether or not they're vegetarian or not. I don't know. Downstate judge overturned Pritzker's stay-at-home order. So it's possible to do these stay, kill these stay-at-home orders. How is this case done? You get a link. It's very interesting. They have the complaint. And they have the judge's decision. Very important to read because, as I've been telling you about equity uh, remedies and in, in equity, uh, where you have injunction, that's what this case is. And you see how to lay it out. There's a copy of it written by an attorney. If you didn't understand how to do it before, you understand. You read what he says. You can do it too for you. Now, what I found fascinating about this car, this court case, comes out of somebody. Let's see. I mean, I'm doing uh, this for you, and let's pray for wisdom. Let's pray for guidance. Bailey said in a video while maintaining that a stay at home order. order order requires legislative action. It's a t- time for a new day, friends. The common sense movement that values life, that values integrity, that values honesty. It's time for us to take back Illinois and we can do this. And I'm sorry to, that I don't get the name in the, the listing here. They just have Bailey. He's a, probably a representative. Uh, they say that his judgment is only for him. I'm not so sure that's the case. You may have to petition in Illinois for being someone similarly situated because that's what an equity case allows. I don't know why he's saying it for him. His facts have to be your facts. You have to be the similarly situated party that wasn't heard but have the same condition, and you too can just enter into this. This also shows the standard by how you're going to go about doing this. This is what I was appreciated about this case. He's actually putting out his paperwork. Let me offer you something inside the document, and I forgot to pull it up, the exact statement, but look for the statement in the document about what he's suing was interfered with. Uh, Representative Bailey. So here, Senate State Representative Darren Bailey from Xenia, Republican, filed a suit today, April 23rd, against Governor J.B. Pritzker for a violation of civil rights. This became a big deal down in the Twitter, I think, also. I think Gary was advancing this from the federal side. There's still another couple things you have to do to, to perfect that. But anyway, somebody law, sues. He didn't really do it on the suit. It's an equity action. It's not really a civil rights suit. It was for, and this is the important part, a restraint against his leaving his house. In other words, when you read the words of the equity action, you'll actually see the words of a habeas corpus. 
This is something the habeas says, what I told you you might want to consider better, because it's a lot cheaper as well and a lot quicker. And you put the burden on the other side to show that they can constrain you. Well, if they're locking you down without quarantine, you've been considered victim. You're, you're a, a guilty before you had any, any proof. And so within this equity action, I think, is two paths. In fact, I was as I was thinking, I would do both. I would move it as a habeas with that restraint of liberty, because that's what a habeas is to relieve you of, the restraint, the unlawful restraint of liberty. But I would put it in the alternative, having an injunction. Because what he's done here is he has a temporary injunction that issued, and he's got it, that, that is a slower process, even though it went pretty quickly. He's already got his decision since April 23rd, see? It's very quick. And so this was a fascinating uh, observation for you all. You can sue against these orders. You can shoo, sue for the restraint of liberty. And how did he do it? He did it on the extension, uh, the excess of time. That simple. And it's only a five-page complaint. So I'm excited in that there, there, we now have an example. If you didn't believe what I was explaining to you, the form is written down now for you. If you needed to see the pictures, uh, instead of just your facts, which is the form, relative to your harm and relative to the unlawful nature of the imposition. This reads as an injunction. I'm telling you when they spoke of the cause, the restraint of liberty, that's habeas corpus. You can choose which way you want to go. I'm just telling you there's options. And every one of you in this nation should be pulling this out right here. If your facts come out to be what this case has done, you get to do this too. And why you haven't to do it when I've been telling you to do it for, for at least six months, five, five months, excuse me, and oh, ten years, this exact method is astonishing to me, I said, I guess, if that's a proper adjective. I don't even know what I feel about it. What is the problem? Why are we crickets? Why aren't we just moving this forward? This guy says he's a representative. I've done it for you. Well, he did it for himself. We know that because apparently they're advertising that this doesn't extend to anybody. And in one regard, it doesn't. But if you're someone similarly situated and you understand how to say that, you could, and you live there, and you can say the facts been an affidavit, you can extend this to those, and I guess I would actually, when I was thinking about it, you would ask the judge to correct his, or um, amend his decision here to extend to those similarly situated. And they, anybody similarly situated would just take this case and then use it. No more money to the bank, to the, to the bank system, yeah, the, the courts. So habeas, I think, is a much cheaper action, and it's the same words. Uh, my, when I read that, I go, why didn't they do this as a habeas? I don't know. The attorney went the other way. And that's a choice you get to make. And so, if I was to combine them le legitimately, I would say there's a habeas corpus, and the alternative, it's an injunction, if there's a question. But I would write it as an equity action, no question. And so you don't have an ex I guess there's no excuse. Now you have the form, if you didn't understand it. You see the list of stuff, you know it's uh, what I was talking about. The limitation in time is enough. When it exceeds the time, it's enough. And so, moving forward and moving into this idea of the exigency of how this is a, supposed to be something that actually ran across in my study here this last uh, yesterday I think it was the same thing I've told you said by somebody else I think it was back in March when I was I think uh, well, I was doing it back in February but, but what's the difference between pandemic and epidemic why did this come up in my mind is because they're not there I've been reading enough to know that there's a list for when these emergency orders can be invoked and I've never, ever seen the statement that has to be made other than COVID-19, which is not in the list of the things that allow the governor to make a statement. Okay, so I told you, be careful. What don't you see? The silence is in, maybe is as important as the, as the thing you're reading. What's the difference between a pandemic and epidemic? This is a serious observation that isn't really the point. It just explains what I've told you before. What? what the WHO did in their pandemic phasing and against what an epidemic is. And the WHO is international. And you'll read in this article, I think this is the article, you'll read what the WHO does as a suggestion. And then I learned something that I hadn't known before relative to, I understood the phasing, I explained all of this stuff, everything that's in here I explained what I didn't explain because I didn't really quite understand once the pandemic is named, I figured that was just the, that just declared something and everybody kind of got the authority to do certain stuff. What it actually does, it actually is a function of action. When they declare the pandemic, the story tells you, and this is talking from a doctor's point of view, what it does is it triggers the jurisdiction that's suffering it 
to go from containment to mitigation. In other words, they've lost the fire, step back, we've got to step way back, and now we're going to try and contain. Well, that's risk management, not hazard, not hazard suppression. Just what I've been telling you. The WHO always treats this as a risk, like climate change. It's a risk to be managed. It's not. They don't deal with the harm. If you're not dealing with the harm, you could get hurt. So this containment, this word, just this one word and this observation opened up a whole new study quick that I had to go do because it started to trigger on what has what I've been missing. So here I'm telling you that you can read lots. Sometimes things don't trigger, and then sometimes all of a sudden they do, and the dominoes fall into place. Pandemic and epidemic. Guess what you have to go find in all the laws? You have to find an epidemic. Guess what's not declared an epidemic? They jump right to pandemic, and there's a difference. And then I saw that it goes from the declaration on the international side is an action suggestion. You, it's gone too far to contain. You go now to mitigate. Now, then I started reading stories, and guess what I started to find? The word containment. That got me into New York. But what does it mean to declare a pandemic? This is another report, and then it recites uh, the CDC through the World Health Organization. And it states that there, there's distinct differences between an outbreak, an epidemic, and pandemic. Guess what? Did you hear the other word that we haven't heard too much? What was it? We've heard pandemic, and we've heard epidemic, and I'm telling you, I, the laws say an epidemic has to be declared. What is the new word? Outbreak. I realized when I saw that relative to this discussion of what the declaration of a pandemic is through, from the World Health Organization and their delineation, I needed to go to the CDC and see if they say the same thing. And sure enough, the CDC makes the same determination. And it says occasionally that the amount of, of disease in a community rises above the expected level. Epidemic refers to an increase, often sudden, in the number of cases of disease above what is normally expected in the population in that area. Outbreak carries the same definition of up epidemic, but it's often used for a more limited geographic area. I'm going to jump down to pandemic, refers to an epidemic that has spread over several countries and continents, usually affecting a large number of people. Let's go back up. We hadn't seen that outbreak. You also see the word of geographic area. There's the limited territory extended to the governor to declare. Then I went to the news and I found out in the news they talked about Cuomo actually ordering out the guard, National Guard there to contain an area under this COVID. And I realized there was another clue sitting right there that maybe we're looking past. Unless you see the outbreak determined, you can't have an epidemic. If you don't have an epidemic, you can't go to pandemic. This is exactly what happened at the WHO that I called out. I told you they said as pandemic. The What I didn't see was the declaration of an epidemic. What they're declaring in the orders is COVID-19. That's not an epidemic. They need something, again, on the police. looking at police power strictly, they needed to declare there was an outbreak that then extends to an epidemic, and it ends there for the state because the state's statutes say the governor can declare an emergency at the epidemic. What you read when you read carefully, like I've been telling you to read, these orders do not declare an epidemic, let alone the outbreak which starts it. There's no point of beginning. My mind says that's a due process violation that was required when you go see the statutory requirements of what needs to be identified as a specific cause. They needed to have the outbreak listed. They need to have a declaration of the outbreak. Then they needed to have the declaration of an epidemic. And I look, this is where I spent most of the time. I could not find an epidemic declaration by, by the New York government. They all rely on this COVID fofo. And so we go to, uh, so now I said, okay, well, what's the, uh, what's the disaster, emergency disaster, disaster declarations for, for, um, New York? What's the limits of the time? I'm looking now for the time. And here we come up with the link I have actually shows a list of terms that are used for uh, declaring uh, disasters, and there we see the word epidemic. Now, there's a couple of others like bacteriological, biological, or chemical release. That's like wartime stuff. This is the level of the of the attack. I do see the word epidemic. Do I see COVID? No. Do I see pandemic? No. These are particular terms for conditions, and I wouldn't see pandemic because that's international, isn't it? 
And so we see correlation in the in the thoughts. I'm going through this kind of fast with you here, but I, my mind's going even faster. So I'm just storming through this because I want to find out when's the time, the, the extension of the time, and over what. There had to be an epidemic declaration. You won't find one. If you find one, I want to know about it. Mark on the beast at protonmail.com. Uh, I've looked all over. They don't declare an emergency over an epidemic. This is why they're doing declarations of general powers, because they don't have a public health emergency. It's a fraud. Anyway, going through this, I find in New York there's a six-month time these powers can exist. So, New York, you need to confine this down. Let me move on. Now I wanted to know, okay, well, where's the where's the limit to the power to suspend po rights? In, in New York law under Section 29A, it says suspension uh, of these uh, rights. They only exist for 30 days at a time. They can only, all y'all have a liberty interest in moving about the country, could only be constrained for 30 days unless you can find an extension, but there has to be the cause. None of you that didn't step out immediately to say, wait a minute, we're way beyond that now. Your rules don't work. You're now restraining me of my liberty. That's a habeas corpus. Or, as we see can do, be done, uh, the, the injunction are allowing the government, are tolerating the government to, defy, to, to destroy your rights. I looked at the 2020 coronavirus pandemic in New York as a wiki. I could not find the epidemic declaration. I, I could find an agency responding in the six-month time of emergency waiting on the governor's. It's an environmental agency in the, in the state of New York. And you go right through what their rules are, and they are given the power to do this, and they're extending this thing out six months, the, the statutory time of the extent of an emergency. But they never say there's an epidemic. They refer to COVID. COVID's not an epidemic. It's only characterized as pandemic, which is not within the jurisdiction to say. And so if you go through these statutes, you can parse out exactly the fraud. Even if you agree the orders are existent and lawful, they've lost their shelf life. They've lost their capacity to, uh, to declare something objective that you can follow. And uh, another Twitter response, uh, James Wood, anybody else intrigued by the behavior of this virus? It can reinfect the host even when the host has antibodies that presumably work to help others? If so, why aren't they stopping the host from being reinfected as if the virus were engineered to behave in unexpected ways? Well, that's a way to seed an idea. But really, what's going on? I said, if you replace it, I responded, if you replace it with common cold, not so mysterious. It's only presumptively a virus, but the CDC and the FDA agree there is no test. Bonus, given there is no protection against reinfection, there can be no vaccine. Folks, because this thing is not a health emergency, they're telegraphing it by not declaring health emergencies. This is an attack on your nation. And you sit there as crickets. When all the black and white, even if you agreed they may have had something in the beginning, they had all the black and white violation for you to point out, and you didn't. Why? I guess that's up for you to think about. I know we're doing stuff, and it takes a bit, because everyone's just kind of behind it. But we're still doing what we can. I would hope you step up and do that. It's really kind of a simple. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, actually, in a way. It's kind of interesting. Like I said, it's kind of exciting. We have the time to out all this, the whole entire thing. I hope you will join me and do that where you are. Thank you, Grimmer, for what you do at reallibertymedia.com and uh, all the simulcast, the jewels at ucy.tv and all the simul, uh, simulcasting going on, the sound mind, the normalization of ignorance, posting afterwards. And whoever's out there, let me know if you're doing it. I can give everybody a heads up to show up at your website. I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose. A can of whoop ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop ass. <laughs>